What's up, YouTubers and plant lovers? It's Justin, and today I wanted to show you how I care for my pygmy date palm. Now I'm sure a bunch of you have probably heard it called the miniature date palm, the dwarf date palm, or the pygmy date palm, but what I'm talking about is the scientific name of Phoenix robellini. Now I looked it up and it says it could be pronounced robellini or robellini I. It doesn't seem right to me, but I've heard it actually be called both uh, in regards to the scientific name for it, but alas, I am talking about the pygmy date palm. Uh, and as you can see, I have a fairly healthy specimen right here. I've had him for about a year now. I would say probably closer to 11 months, something around there, give or take a month or so. Uh, but uh, this is one of my pride and joys. I used to have a majestic palm, uh, and then I also had, a, I've got a couple saguaros, uh, cardboard palms, um, the parlor palms. Uh, but this is kind of a newer kid on the block, uh, kind of coming over to our knowledge and our existence probably about uh, 50 years ago, uh, give or take a decade. Um, but it's a really kind of sophisticated and graceful looking palm with really kind of thin leaves on there. Uh, but yeah, it kind of reminds me a lot of the, the majestic palm, uh, but it's a little bit hardier, I think. Uh, to kind of our indoor growing conditions that uh, most homes actually experience. Um, and it seems to actually get along fairly well uh, indoors around the winter months and the slow growing seasons. Uh, but whenever it gets to about early spring, you kind of want to set it outside. Now, uh, I say they are a little bit hardy. They can take a light frost uh, just for a couple of days. Uh, but if it gets too extensive with the cold, uh, your plant will probably die. Now, I want to talk about size with these guys because there is a common misconception as to how large they can get, although it's not off by much. Uh, indoors, I've heard people say it rarely ever tops five feet. That's pretty much true. It rarely ever gets any taller than five or six feet indoors. Outdoors, though, they say that it never tops ten feet. Although, if you go to Florida, you will see that some of them actually do uh, exceed the ten-foot mark. Uh, and I just think that's really because they haven't had a whole lot of time to grow in our country and uh, actually get as large as they can. But alas, uh, it is the pygmy date palm, so don't expect too large of a palm uh, from this guy. They usually stop growing, uh, like I said, indoors about six feet, uh, and then outdoors they will flower. Uh, these plants are dioecious, which means that any plant is either a male or a female. Uh, so the males will have flowers and the females will have flowers, but only the females outside will actually produce uh, fruit uh, of the dates that are safe to actually eat. Uh, the ASPCA and many vets actually say that this plant is non-toxic, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, even birds can kind of get up in here uh, and uh, play with it no problem if they chew on it. Uh, if you have a little one that likes to put something in their mouth, this plant is uh, pretty safe. Now I say pretty safe uh, because I don't know if you can see, but at the leaf bases around here it is armed with some kind of sharper leaves or stems that kind of poke out. Uh, and then as you get closer to the base uh, and around the bottom of the tree, uh, it will actually kind of poke you a lot of, or kind of around the base of the plant and the roots. So uh, anytime that you're going to prune this plant or even transplant it, I recommend wearing gloves and wearing eye, protective eyewear uh, because you can get poked uh, and it will hurt. Um, and that being said, you have to be very careful when you transplant one of these guys. Uh, typically, I've always heard that uh, if you transplant it outdoors, say that you live in a house and you planted it in your yard and then you decide to move a couple years later and you want to dig it up and take him uh, to your new place plants like this uh, the pygmy date palm rarely ever make it whenever being dug up and then being transplanted into its new place uh, and typically i think that's because they have very delicate roots you have to be very careful whenever you transplant it normally I would tell you to get your root rake out and kind of rough it up and uh, give the roots a good shake up to let them kind of spread out and open up some. 
uh, but with your pygmy date palm, you do not want to do that. Um, to transplant it, you very lightly want to kind of squeeze the root base to kind of loosen the roots up slightly in its growing container. Uh, and then take it out and immediately put it into its new container and then fill it in with soil around the sides. Uh, and make sure before you put it in that you actually do have about two to three inches of soil around the bottom. Uh, particularly soil that drains really well. These guys are heavy drinkers. Uh, they like a bunch of water, especially in the uh, growing months. Uh, it's, un it's not uncommon to water your pygmy date palm two or three times a week, especially when the heat goes up. So anytime these guys get a lot of light and a lot of heat, they need a lot of water and a lot of humidity to keep them kind of thriving as well. Um, and then uh, that being said, make sure that your soil uh, drains really well. You want to make sure it has a lot of sand in it or a lot of perlite, something that's not going to retain a bunch of water. Uh, so I used, whenever I transplanted him a couple months ago, I used uh, the cacti soil that has a lot of sand in it uh, so that it will actually kind of drain out. And on the top part, uh, since I have him indoors for about six months in Kentucky weather, uh, I have an indoor kind of miracle Grow formulation uh, that's not supposed to attract a lot of uh, soil-loving pests. Uh, so uh, I actually do have a little bag of it right here. It's in a gray little bag, and it says miracle Grow on there, and it says the indoor formula. And it's actually formulated to keep uh, the soil-loving pests uh, from actually being attracted to this right here. Um, but other than that, I want to talk about the light for this guy. Now, uh, it's normally found in its native environments around South uh, China, uh, kind of like Laos, and I want to say uh, Vietnam. So uh, around there, they are typically found around lakes and riverbeds, uh, but there is a kind of dense understory, and these guys don't get too tall. So uh, in their natural environments, they do receive kind of direct sunlight, uh, kind of bright light, uh, but if they're grown in the kind of canopy where they're often found sometimes, uh, you can also be sure that they're going to get a lot of uh, filtered light uh, that's not really a whole bunch of direct light. So an established plant uh, in a container or even outside can probably take uh, direct sunlight for a while. Um, and if it's a well-established plant it, uh, and is used to it, it can actually take uh, direct light uh, probably all day. Although uh, around the coastal areas where they get a lot of humidity uh, and bright light, they'll need a lot of water. Uh, but further inland uh, and kind of more around the semi-desert areas, uh, if they don't receive a whole bunch of light, they don't need a whole bunch of water to actually keep them going. Uh, typically when they're found further inland, they're often kind of uh, in partial shade environments. Uh, and so if they're not receiving a whole bunch of light, they're not going to need a whole bunch of water to go along with that or a whole bunch of humidity either. But indoors, uh, I have mine in an east facing, in an east facing window. Like I said, uh, they don't need a whole bunch of light. They can get away with kind of partial dappled filtered light. Uh, and then take some bright light, uh, which in an east facing window, it would receive ample morning sunlight and then protection from the sun during the uh, later part in the day. Um, so I have him sitting in an east facing window and he's under a little bit of LED lights that kind of reflect a little bit of light too and he seems to be rather at home there. Um, I have him close by where the orchids sit uh, and they are under artificial grow lights as well. Uh, so there is a humidifier in there, and it seems to uh, keep him rather happy and healthy. Um, so a little piece of advice, if you do have your humidifier going, always make sure you have a fan in there kind of uh, on uh, so that uh, airflow will kind of move through there as well. If you have um, a whole bunch of moisture and humidity in the air, and the air is rather stagnant and not moving around, you can invite rot and pest and disease into your plants. So anytime you do have a lot of humidity, make sure you do increase the airflow some as well uh, to prevent any of that from kind of settling in there with your plants. Now, as I said, they are heavy drinkers. Uh, so during the slower months uh, in the winter time though, you do want to kind of slow the water intake down. As I said, they're not receiving as much uh, light uh, that they normally receive during the growing months. So uh, you'll want to drop the watering during the winter months down to about once, maybe twice a month, just enough to kind of keep the plant alive.
Now, as I was saying, with humidity during the growing months, you want it to be kind of on the moderate or high end, um, and they are very appreciative of that and love a lot of humidity. Uh, but uh, during the growing, uh, excuse me, the winter months, uh, you may want to kind of slow the humidity down a little bit too, uh, just because they aren't photosynthesizing as much, so they don't need a whole bunch of water and a whole bunch of humidity uh, also. Um, as I said earlier, they need very porous, very rich, organic kind of soil. As long as they're not holding on to a lot of water and they have adequate drainage holes in the bottom of the pot, your plant should be okay. Now that being said, I also have it in a terracotta pot. I have it in a terracotta pot for two reasons. One, uh, as they do get a little bit older, they can get a little bit top heavy, so you don't want it to kind of fall over and be knocked over and break the pot and damage the plant and damage the plant's kind of sensitive roots that may end up killing the plant also. Um, but uh, the other reason I have it in a terracotta pot is because terracotta pots are porous and they have a lot of holes in there uh, and that will help kind of wick excess water out of the soil uh, and keep your plant from succumbing to root rot or just drowning in there as well. When it comes to uh, about the uh, pH of the soil, I know that plants that uh, have a pH higher than 7 typically have problems uh, of like chlorosis or leaf spot. Now, uh, chlorosis means that base is a condition where the plant doesn't have as much chlorophyll as it needs. And as we know, chlorophyll helps with the photosynthesizing and is also there uh, with the green coloration of the leaves. So if your leaves turn really kind of bright yellow or pale looking or even have a lot of leaf spot in there or discolorations on the spots of the leaves, uh, then you may want to check your soil pH. Typically they like it to be around neutral, around 7, or slightly acidic. Uh, so if you want to increase the uh, pH of your soil, you can add in some cocoa core or some organic means like that, uh, but uh, Epsom salt can help, uh, and I always use cocoa core, or you can use an acid uh, booster, like uh, something that you would get at Lowe's for your azaleas, or your rhododendrons, or anything like your blueberries would help that as well. Typically the plant is sowed in a grouping kind of bunching fashion, uh, but usually whenever they're grown outdoors, it comes in the formation of one giant stem. Uh, and I say giant, but it's not really that large. Uh, the diameter of the trunk is usually fairly small with a diameter of around three to six inches. Uh, and the uh, older they get, uh, you will have some kind of dead kind of leaves around the top or the bottom of the crown uh, where the leaves kind of arc out. Uh, and if you remove that, as they get older, you can see the appearance of kind of a knobby uh, stem, for lack of a better word, there. So uh, as they get older, they do kind of have like knobby protuberances uh, that uh, do kind of give the stem its general characteristics. Um, and like I said, they aren't too large. Uh, so people often group them together uh, and you'll see them kind of planted in groups of twos or threes to kind of give an appearance of a multi-trunked palm. Uh, but typically they are grown uh, separately with one trunk that usually grows up pretty straight. Uh, but sometimes growers will plant them at kind of a, an arc or kind of at an angle, uh, and then as it kind of follows the stem or the sun, it will actually kind of uh, give it an arcing appearance uh, of its trunk too. Uh, but like I said, a lot of times growers will actually plant them together to actually give them the uh, appearance that it's got multiple stems, but usually uh, in pots or containers, it's found growing uh, just with a single stem, uh, but a lot of times growers will put a couple of them in there. It looks like I have about three or four uh, plants planted in there together uh, to kind of give it its luscious kind of filling crown that I really kind of like on it. Like I said, the leaves arc uh, and they get anywhere from three to five feet long depending on how large the specimen is and how old it is. Uh, and uh, the leaves just really are great and they look spectacular in a terracotta pot. Uh, as I said earlier, their temperatures, they can survive a light frost. Grown in the USDA zones, I think around 9 and 10 is where they're around the most comfortable. So if you live in like Southern California or Florida, you could probably get away with growing them outside. Uh, though you do have to be careful if you live around the coast uh, because they don't take uh, salt spray very well. 
um, but they aren't really too picky with their soil as long as they actually drain really well. Uh, they can get away with uh, most kinds of soil. They can get away with clay soils as long as you don't overwater them too much. But like I said, they do like a lot of water, so using clay soils or planting them in soils with a lot of clay in it may be a little difficult uh, to actually keep yours thriving and looking really well. Um, I said earlier they need light, uh, at least uh, partial full sun. Uh, and if they are planted in full shade, it probably will kill the plant. Uh, so I wouldn't put them in anywhere that's exposed to a bunch of drafts or wind. Or, uh, wind uh, and make sure that you actually do uh, keep it safe uh, from salt sprays uh, and situations like that. Fortunately with these plants, they don't have a lot in the way of pests. Uh, they do have some. Most of the, pro most of the time, the problems are going to be scale. Uh, so if you notice that your uh, plant has what looks like kind of little dome spots on there that are discolored or any brown or green, uh, it's basically a little spot on there with a dome kind of covering shape on there. Uh, and that dome shape will actually protect the bug uh, from an onslaught of chemical uh, mean so if you ever have a problem with scale your best bet is to take a sharp knife or a sharp pair of scissors and kind of scrape it off uh, and then flush it down the toilet flush it down the sink or even put it in a container for bugs that you may have uh, put a little bit of my grandma used to take a jar of uh, gasoline and she would take a little jar and then put a couple drops of gasoline in the bottom and then put the uh, bugs down in there that were eating her roses so uh, I've since done that uh, with scale also I um, take a little glass jar and if I'm picking things off I'll put like one drop of gasoline in there and I do that outside and make sure that I stick the bugs down in there as well uh, but you got to be careful because uh, any kind of pest may spread to any other plant that you have uh, in your home. So always make sure that if you're doing something like that, you do it outside uh, and you are careful not to actually spread that to other plants. Uh, because I know citrus have a problem with scale, these have a problem with scale, uh, and a handful of other uh, indoor plants also have a problem with scale as well. Now they also have a problem with mealybugs, thrips, weevils, caterpillars, and grasshoppers. Uh, and fortunately with all these pests that this plant struggles with, uh, a good rule of thumb is to actually take your tree or your plant, set it in the bathtub or set it outside and spray it off with the uh, garden hose or with detachable shower head and uh, you'll be able to knock most of those bugs off with the stream or a blast of water. With disease, uh, I know that they have a problem with some stem. It's actually called Ganondorma butt rot. I couldn't make that up if I was trying. Uh, but that's a fungal disease that lives in the soil and it will feast on the bottom part of the trunk uh, and cause it to rot uh, and there is no known cure for that. Uh, but you have to be very careful when getting rid of a plant that has that problem uh, because that can spread relatively easy to your other uh, pygmy date palms as well. Uh, and then a kind of leaf spot is another problem that these guys will have. I know that if there's a boron deficiency, a lot of times you'll see uh, a lot of their newer leaves uh, kind of coming up in like a spear shape and they won't actually open. So you can, uh, if you notice that that is a problem with a lot of your plants, that they have several different kind of leaf stems arcing up, but they're not opening up. Uh, you can have a problem with a boron deficiency. Uh, they have a problem with magnesium, manganese, iron deficiencies. Uh, so if you suspect that your plant has any of these problems, uh, you could message me either on Instagram or through my email or on YouTube, and I will try to uh, best help you identify what your problem is and uh, the best way to actually counter that problem. As I was saying earlier, they do kind of have a problem with being repotted and transplanted. So anytime that you need to transplant your uh, pygmy date palm, make sure you do that kind of in the springtime uh, because they uh, do have really delicate roots and you will end up um, probably hurting your plant rather than doing some good. Uh, but you just got to be soft for it. And a lot of people will actually like to actually kind of pick them up and transplant them into a newer spot in their new home. Uh, but as I said earlier, they do have a really delicate kind of root mass. 
So if you do plan on transplanting it, make sure you dig a massive hole uh, and then uh, actually take out more than you think the roots will actually be in the soil. And if you do that, uh, your plant will have a larger chance of actually making it uh, once it's been transplanted. Well guys, that's really all I wanted to say about this plant. Like I said, it is a newer kid on the block, uh, just coming into our stores here in the last couple of years. Uh, so if you ever uh, have a chance of getting a pygmy date palm, I would recommend going ahead and getting one uh, because they are really great plants to have. They are perfect potted plant pals. And while you're at it, leave me a message or a comment and let me know if you've ever had any kind of success or failures with the pygmy date palm. Uh, or even what your favorite indoor palm tree is. Like I said, you can't leave these guys indoors year round, uh, but once it starts getting a little bit cooler outside, you can bring them in, and uh, they should be fine as long as you give them a decent amount of light, uh, average water and humidity inside your home. Uh, your plant will be fine until the next spring uh, when you could go ahead and put it outside. Uh, around early to mid uh, March or April and while you're at it hit the subscribe button or the bell next to it that way you'll know anytime I've uploaded a new video you guys take it easy have a good one and don't forget always plant prudently thank you YouTube